Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason, and I am joined today on uh, this live stream, our annual, annual, weekly live stream with uh, Zach Weismiller of Reason. Say hello, Zach. Hello. <clears throat> and uh, we are joined today by Robert Pondicio, who's an education analyst and expert at AEI, the American Enterprise Institute. You wrote a fantastic book about success academies, the charter school system, uh, you work at the Fordham Institute, and you were also a uh, school teacher in the South Bronx, right, Robert? Uh, I was. It's been a few years since I've been uh, in the classroom, but uh, the rest of those, guilty as charged. Yeah. Uh, what was the name of the book again? I'm sorry. I, uh, it, it was called How the Other Half Learns. Uh, right. came out about uh, two or three years ago. Yeah. And um, that was uh, you know, a fantastic work. We talked about that. Um, what's interesting about you, obviously, is that you are a proponent of school choice in the broadest terms possible, mm -hmm. but you also call bullshit, both on a lot of things that are happening in the uh, public schools, but also in the private schools. And so uh, we're going to talk about the varieties of school choice. And we're going to and we're also going to talk about what's wrong with public schools, mm -hmm. as well as private schools, including the wokeness of elite prep schools everywhere, which are the worst of the bunch. <laughs> um, but let's start talking about um, the, what we use as the title for this, which I have now, uh, I, I don't have in front of me because why did of technical issues. Teaching kids how to read? Yes, why did schools stop teaching kids how to read? Well, maybe um, we should Rob, call it, why didn't they start? <laughs> yeah, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's talk about this. You wrote a, uh, uh, an op-ed in the um, uh, New York Post, uh, about, uh, I don't know, about eight or nine months ago, expert idiocy on teaching kids to read is beyond, beyond comprehension. Um, what are you talking about there? What's the problem with the way kids are taught to read? Um, one, it's, it's, well, it's complicated. All of these topics that you enumerated mm -hmm. up top, Nick, are, are, are all complicated. So it's going to be a challenge to do anything more than scratch the surface in an, in sure. an hour. Um, but I, I mean, you know, at the, at the risk of being the guy who waves the bloody shirt, you know, most of what I learned about literacy, I, I kind of learned the hard way as a, as a South Bronx fifth grade teacher. And to kind of set the scene, I was a, you know, a second career teacher. I had a whole other career in life in the media world um, until I was almost 40. And then, then I signed up to be um, a fifth grade teacher in the South Bronx for two years uh, under the, the, the New York City Teaching Fellows Program. Uh, two years turned into five, and, and I never quite went back to my, my other life partially because I became kind of alarmed and militant about um, you know, not just reading instruction, uh, but, but, but curriculum at large. In other words, you know, at, at the time in the policy world, everybody was talking about uh, you know, assessment and testing and accountability and teacher quality. And I was like, um, can we talk about what the kids do all day? Because that seems to matter and nobody seems to be talking about it. So you know, the, 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 my real uh, beef, as it were, with, with the way I was taught to teach uh, reading and, and writing, frankly, um, is, is that it, is, it, it made a lot of mistaken assumptions, not the least of which is this idea that reading comprehension is a skill. Um, and at the risk of wonking out a little bit, I mean, it's important to yep. kind of think of reading as kind of like having two main components. The first is what we call decoding. You know the ability to look at a piece of text and mm -hmm. translate those you know, symbols into into words, and the second far more prodigious challenge is is understanding what the hell those words mean. You know, so right. in other words, there's there's the, the quote skill of reading. That is a skill. I could show you nonsense words right now, and even though they don't exist, we could all agree how they sound, so to speak. But the much tougher nut to crack is is the comprehension piece. Um, and as you know, Nick, that's how I became a disciple of E.D. Hirsch Jr. Right. and his core knowledge and cultural literacy views. Because as, as I've said, I think I've even said this to you, he was the one guy who described what I saw in my South Bronx classroom every single day. Kids who could decode for the most part, right. but struggled with comprehension. And that piece that you showed from the New York Post was kind of like the, 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 the antithesis of that. Uh, I was trained right. under the methods uh, taught by Lucy Calkins of Teachers College, mm -hmm. which broadly speaking said, oh, well, look, it has to be, you know, kids, kids aren't reading because they're bored, they're disengaged, you know, the curriculum isn't about their interests, you know, mm -hmm. so we need to make it more about them so they'll be motivated and engaged. And Hirsch was the guy who's like, no, it's background knowledge, it's vocabulary. Um, right. and, and at the risk of over summarizing, Hirsch is right, Calkins is wrong. So let's talk a little bit about this in, in uh, terms that uh, kind of uh, certainly parents might understand or anybody who's been reading 
you know, mm -hmm. education kind of policy arguments for, you know, at really 60 years. How to translate this into uh, just how, to, how does this intersect with arguments over whole language learning yeah. to read and phonics? Yeah, I, I think mostly that's the first part of that. If, mm -hmm. if, if what a colleague of mine once described reading as a two lock box, the first lock is the decoding piece, the second piece is the comprehension piece. So that's the first box. Um, you know, and this is not new. I mean, there'd be somewhere behind me on that bookshelf, there's a book from 1955 called Why Johnny Can't Read. Right. We were arguing about this then before either one of us. Hey, was uh, Robert, I'm just going to ask you because yeah. I think your microphone, uh, you're clicking against it. Would you mind just, oh. why don't you take the earbuds out I'm completely? The jacket or, maybe that might help. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can we hear you now? I don't think so. Oh, okay. now. Put them back in. Yeah. Probably. Okay, put put it back in and just keep the jacket zipped up. Sorry, this is we're having a little of a, a technical yeah, rough start. Today. This is our yeah. two lock box here. Yeah. yeah. Okay, can you uh, uh you might have to oh you know what he's muted, so I hold on. on there. Yeah. Uh, nope. Did no, that you, work? I think he muted himself, it says. Okay, there, there we go. Yeah. yeah Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and just I will, I will try not to talk with my hands and, uh, and, and it looks like you guys got booted off now. So let's just keep improvising here. So anyway, as I was, as I was saying in answer to, to your question, Nick, if you can still hear me, we've been arguing about, you know, phonics versus whole language for you know, well over half a century. Um, as far as I can tell back from, you know, the, the Rudolph Flesh book, why Johnny can't read in 1955, you know, back then we didn't call it whole language. We called it the look, say method and, and why Johnny can't read, um, you know, took apart uh, the the, the so-called look-say method. And, and then, you know, 30 years, 40 years after that, we had the National Reading Panel, you know, which was, was put together uh, by an act of Congress, which once again said it's phonics, basically. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but it, it, it re reasserted uh, that, that phonics was, was the way to go. Um, so what we're having now is the the, the, the latest version of, a, of an argument, a debate yeah. that has gone on for well over half a century. But but what's important here, I mean, or part of your critique is, and and I apologize to our uh, audience uh, because we're having technical issues with the the program that we're using to stream this. So Robert is constant. Uh, Zach and I seem to be intermittent, perhaps a uh, uh, you know a kind of echo of our shoddy academic careers or something <laughs> in and out of the classroom. But um, no, but I'm um, the Al Haig of reason. I'm in charge yeah. here. Yeah, you can just keep talking, uh, you know, and just talk as, as much as you can for as long as you can until somebody tells you to shut up, which I'm sure you're used to as a school teacher. Yes. Um, but um, no, so I, I mean, so part of this, the, the phonics and uh, whole language or look-see method, this, you know, that is about decoding and basic, yeah. I, I, you know, it's hard to say like literacy. I mean, it's like, that people can understand what the letters of the alphabet are and the words that they form, et cetera. That's yeah. a big part of reading, Absolutely. obviously. If you, um, if you can't it, decode, you cannot read, yeah. period. And it's also one of the things that is curious just to bring up about why Johnny can't read. You know, from the mid 50s, a decade that people like Bill Bennett, the you know former education secretary who wrote A Nation at Risk and said, you know what, everything was fucking great in the 50s. The only thing teachers worried about was kids chewing gum in the hallways or something. Um, you know, in fact, when you look back at the 1950s, it was filled with anxiety about the coming idiocracy of America mm. because, you know, kids were fat. They needed the presidential fitness stuff. You know, the, the Soviets were putting satellites into space and we could not read anymore. There was a huge anxiety about that. So in a way, education policy and wonkery is always in a state of, like heightened anxiety, oh, um, yeah. you know, so that, I mean, that's clear, but is there a clear difference between the efficacy of whole language and, and phonics in learning that basic skill of how to read? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I'm answering your question directly, but I mean, if with, with no phonics, there's no, there's no reading. I mean, mm -hmm. for what it's worth, when I was teaching in the South Bronx, um, I, I never had a kid who couldn't decode. They could all decode. Right. So this is why I became more of a comprehension guy. Yeah. Look, this is, this is a blind spot on my part. I, 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 I probably, if you want to say that I've been a little bit blithe about decoding over the years, I'll, I'll own that. That's probably true. Um, 
but I think because it's because it is a skill, it's easier to get kids. I shouldn't say easy, yeah. easier to get kids to the starting line of decoding. Um, and again, this is not the question you're asking, but I think it's important. One of the big mistakes that we're at risk of making right now is conflating decoding mm -hmm. and reading. Right. In other yeah, words, yeah. If, we, if we get every kid in America to, 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 to the decoding starting line by the end of third grade, one, that would be a massive achievement. But that doesn't mean that you know years from now we're going to look at say fourth grade and eighth grade and eight reading scores and see a huge improvement because that second piece of it, the comprehension piece, is is a much much harder nut to crack. So um, you know, I, I, look, I'm a I'm a big fan of what we're seeing uh, across the country in terms of some of these laws, and I know it's you know it's an ironic thing to say to a reason audience that I'm in I'm in favor of state laws on reading. Uh, we can talk about that if you like. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, we're, 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 there's a new seriousness about getting kids to the starting line of decoding that is that is essential, but it's really important that we understand right. it's just the starting line. Okay, well, and so, like, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I do want to kind of talk about that, though. Like, how do school choice advocates like us uh, cope with the widespread adoption of what seems like a clearly flawed teaching strategy? Yeah. Uh, you could see it, like, I, I don't know if like school choice necessarily solves it because then, you know, it it's not necessarily just infiltrating only district schools and yeah. uh, in a way like a more fragmented system might might be more open to that that sort of infiltration. Look, the, you, Nick um, kind of uh, alluded to my calling bullshit on both sides uh, up top. And this is one of those areas in which I've made myself a little bit unpopular with, mm -hmm. with our school choice friends. Um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, given talks or, you know, been, been on panels where I, or where I kind of say this to, to, to school choice and, and also to ed reform people. It's like, you know, if you think about the internal logic of education reform and testing for the last 20 or 30 years, we have this idea that, oh, teachers know what to do. We just need to hold them accountable. Or, or I guess the choice version of that would be to say, oh, there's all this, you know, this, this, this untapped capacity out there in excellence that just needs to be freed from bureaucracy and red tape. Like, where the hell did you get that idea? Because mm -hmm. um, I promise you, it's not true. Um, I mean, I, I use the example in my old school of saying, you know, th this was not an, a, a school where you had, you know, lazy union adults layabouts, you know, waiting to 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 hit their 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 30 years and 25 years of or 55 years old and 25 years of service, punching the clock and counting the days. It was mostly, you know, what I've described as good people trying hard and failing and not failing despite their training, but failing because of their training. You know, so if, if, if we have this idea that either teachers are phoning it in and, 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 and would do better if only we held their feet to the fire or they already know what to do and we don't let them, you got to let that go. That is that is simply not the case. Um, you know, we, we have had any number of kind of demonstrably bad ideas, again, about reading comprehension in particular, that don't go away, either through accountability or because of school choice. Why does it keep happening, though? Like, what is so p appealing about something like Lucy Calkins' approach oh, to so many? That's, in the case that's the world? really easy. Um, I was just telling somebody this yesterday, because these are ideas that are obvious, intuitive, engaging, sexy, and dead wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, in other words, it, it, if, if the, the, to, to broadly oversummarize, I, th I think the big mistake we make is assuming that reading comprehension, and I'm sorry for dwelling upon those distinctions, but they're important, th this idea that reading comprehension is a skill, like throwing a ball or riding a bike, that it doesn't matter what you read as long as you're reading and, you know, um, that, that you're going to become a proficient reader. And that's just not so. Um, you know, back to the Hirsch thing, you've got to have a whole broad body of background knowledge um, because, uh, you know, language comprehension, broadly oversimplified, it, it, it's, a, it's a kind of shorthand, you know, that we, we, we every conversation we have, everything, every, literate speakers and writers assume their audiences are operating with the same, you know, schema, the same broad body of background knowledge. And when that's true, conversation is is fluid. I mean, it's it's almost like the, you know the, the words we are using are the tip of the iceberg, and below the waterline is a whole lot of context, vocabulary, um, ambiguities around words. Yeah. I mean, th th think of the word "shot," for example. Simple word "shot." Everybody knows what it is. Every kid comes to school knowing that word "shot." Well, it means a very different thing on a basketball court, in a doctor's office, in a rifle range, in a bar. 
you know, if you don't know yeah. those contexts, and, and, and this is one example, but all of language is like that. Our most simple utterances rely on shared background knowledge and shared context. Um, sorry, that was a long discursive answer. Yeah, can I, well, well uh, two things just to, uh, to ask about that. Is it clear that cultural literacy, uh, you know, has declined? And, and Hirsch was writing at the, uh, you know, what, at the end of the 80s, right? Uh, yeah, that's about right. Um, Nick's gone again, so I'll just, I'll just, I'll just run with that question. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it, it, language is a cultural construct, and and uh, it, it, it's uncomfortable to talk about this, but I mean, there is a dominant language culture, and it relies a lot on the idioms and cultural illusions uh, of that that people assume you know. So, I, is it different? Well, let's say, for example, we decide, oh, we're not going to teach Greek Greek myths anymore because you know that's that's white supremacy culture. Well, then years from now, when when a you know one of my former students is at a job interview and somebody makes a, a reference to opening Pandora's box or somebody's Achilles heel and the kid goes, huh, what's that? Well, you know, that doesn't mean that the kid is dumb, doesn't mean the kid is poorly educated. It means somebody along the way made a decision that you don't need to know that. Um, fine, we can make that decision as an educator, but that person who might hire him or her across the desk might think differently. Well, how, how could that kid not know Pandora's box? How could that kid not know Achilles' heel? Everybody knows that. And then you make a judgment and someone else gets the job. So, you know, this is this is the message I always preach to teachers is I don't want to be the guy who tells you what kids should know and what they don't need to know, but just understand that those are high stakes uh, decisions with real consequences for kids. So the, the challenge here is, uh, you know, may, maybe there is a need for cultural literacy or there's kind of a, a broad understanding that certain teaching methods are bad and certain teaching methods are better, but it's the, the idea of getting to, to that truth and, and, and how it gets applied across the system. And so that, then that's where these questions of, you know, school choice versus like district or state level management come in. So where do you draw those lines? Because I mean, I guess like my inclination as as someone who's very pro school choice, bullish on school choice, like it's that these kind of have to be worked out and like the cream will rise to the top versus implemented uh, from the top down. Um, but does that have limitations as, as to how far it can be applied. Yeah, it has. Here's, I mean, uh, remind me, Zach, because I do want to go back and kind of, you know, talk about the the, the Lucy Calkin stuff and what happens when we assume that, um, you know, kids just need to read and it doesn't matter what they read, because I think that's okay. a lot of, you know, how these pedagogies kind of take effect because they, they feel good. They're engaging for kids. Um, but, you know, the, the, the answer to your question, I think, you know, and again, you know, I'm a school choice guy, unapologetic. I, you know, I chose my daughter's school. I want you to choose your kid's school, period, full stop. Um, but there's an opportunity cost here. So, so let's say, for example, um, you know, in other words, if teachers have been making this mistake for, for dozens of years, why do we think parents are going to be better at, at uh, being critical consumers of, of um, you know, uh, instructional materials, pedagogy, and whatnot? Mm -hmm. So you may make a may, might make a bad choice, okay? And then your child's education will be harmed and good for the rest of us. We're now learning from your example. So it'll be better for your grandkids. Um, but, but, you know, your kid only gets to be in fourth grade one time, you know, and right. if, and, and if the model with the curriculum that you chose, the school that you chose is, is holding on to bad ideas about literacy. Well, okay. You know, there, there's, uh, you have no one to blame but yourself, I suppose. Um, I'm less worried, frankly, about, you know, the, the engaged parent, um, you know, who, who uh, can be a savvy consumer of, of, of curriculum and school culture and whatnot, th than I am the, the, the families that I used to work with, you know, whether in South Bronx or, or Harlem. I mean, I would see, you know, and, and, and I want to be careful here. I don't want to suggest that they can't make good decisions. They can um, and do. Um, uh, but there's 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 always going to be a problem in education with camp followers. Okay, this is an unlovely thing that we never like to talk about with choice. Um, you know, we we spend billions of dollars on education, and that's a rich you know target of opportunity for a lot of folks who who you know are not necessarily cognitive scientists and well versed and whatnot, and are perfectly happy to cash the check and move on. Um, so you know you got to be you, know, it, you can't assume I think that every parent is going to be um, 
you know, have be very clear eyed about this and that there aren't some unscrupulous motivations among people who will rush into the choice market. That's all. Does that mean I'm not, does that make me a bad choice advocate? Okay. Maybe it does, but I think it makes me a realistic one. Right. So then what, what do you do with that information? Like how, how far, I guess, are you willing to push uh, school choice? Because the, the question always is, um, you, you know, and we'll probably get into some of the, the states that have passed these education savings accounts laws. That's yeah. kind of like the latest frontier in school choice, where you uh, just kind of give the parents um, yep. or it's kind of framed as refunding them some mm -hmm. tax, the, the tax money and they're able to use it at a private school. And then yep. the, the question that you know, we libertarians over here always have as well. Are there going to be strings attached to that? Are there going to be conditions attached to that? It sounds like you might be saying that there there should be some level of string attached. <sighs> Maybe not. Like, how, how do you think about that? This is this is kind of where I stare at my shoes and change the subject um, <laughs> <laughs> because I just don't really have a good answer for you. I mean. Right. What one look, I think it's incredibly naive to think that you're going to take public funding altogether out of um, education. You know, it, it, it just that 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 world doesn't exist and it's not going right. to the idea that you're just going to say trust. It, it makes no more sense to say trust parents and send send more money than when the teachers union would say just trust teachers and, and send more money. You know, public and, dollars and are going to come with. Yeah, and we, uh, well, and we should also point out in in a profound way, public schooling to uh, uh, to um, paraphrase Stokely Carmichael, public schooling is as American as violence and cherry pie. I mean, it, it really goes back to the colonial era where there was yeah. publicly pooled money. So I don't, we yeah. don't have to litigate whether or not there's going to be public money in education. But then, what are the? Oh, what are we the, might, Nick. We might well, have to litigate that because there yeah. are some, especially frankly, on the libertarian right. Sure, who think but, there should be no government role whatsoever. And, and then, then what do you do but, with the 60% of kids who are not going to either homeschool or yeah. uh, what do you do with those kids? Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll say this within the, uh, you know, kind of political battles right now, the right, which broadly speaking is the one that wants to separate state from school, they don't want to do that because they want to be able to control it. And we're going to talk about Ron DeSantis's forays into curriculum development in Florida mm -hmm. or devolution uh, in a bit. But um, what are the limits? Let's just say this, like, because, and it's true, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, most, I went to Catholic school there. The state had certain requirements of all schools that, yeah. you know, got tax breaks and things like that. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's already there. What sure. are the limits that you would put in place on, let's say backpack funding? You know, you get in Arizona, $6,000, $7,000, whatever it is, yeah. is going to go to the kid. They can use it for basically anything. Yep. What kind of school do you say, not that one, or what kind of expense where if the parents say, you know what, we're going to Disneyland and they're going to learn about Pirates of the Caribbean there, um, would you, yeah. you know, like, how do you, how do you create a policy that, you know, kind yeah, of it's, it's, it's a good question. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm probably a lot more, um, you know, libertarian in that regard. Uh, you know, I guess the way I would say that is, look, I, as you can tell, I have some very well-defined ideas mm -hmm. about you know good, better, and best in terms of schools, good, better, and best yeah. in terms of curriculum. I don't want to be the guy that imposes those ideas. I want to persuade you to, to, to adopt some of my ideas, but I don't want to compel you. The, about the, the only thing that I think I would probably compel is, is decoding, is, is early childhood mm -hmm. literacy. You know, in other mm -hmm. words, if you want to take public dollars, you got to get kids to, to, to the decoding line. Um, and then after which that, would, that which would invalidate years. like, you know, most of the schools in New York, right? Most of the public schools, because <laughs> they're not, I mean, seriously, by like you yeah. know, the, the early NAEP scores, the National yeah. Assessment of Educational Progress, what do they have? What, you know, what are the proficiency levels? It's got to be below 50%, right? Oh, I, I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, I mean depending on, on, you know, in the, in the New York Times article on this, they were estimating about a quarter of elementary schools employ Lucy Calkins' methods. Yeah. So that's a huge I bet it's more uh, than that. impact. But, well, yeah. can I, and sorry, I, you know, because I was in and out uh, due to technical difficulties, which are really a form of original sin. I went to Catholic school. <laughs> But learned how to read anyway. Um, but I put everything in terms of why did, uh, and I apologize if you've answered this, but why did 
going from teaching reading, like the first part of decoding, why is that necessarily, even from a progressive point of view, why does that mean, okay, we're not going to teach cultural literacy? Because it's, oh, it yeah. No. Okay. I, I think, I think we can broadly separate those, those, those two things. Okay. Um, I mean, the whole language versus phonics debate versus the, you know, the cultural literacy versus let a thousand flowers bloom. It kind of, I mean, they're related, you know, yeah. there's a through line from one to the other, but okay. they're, but they're, they're distinctly different arguments. Yeah. Okay. Um, but then if we're talking about the kind of, uh, I mean, then is the problem with the, the Lucy Cockett style reading uh, stuff, is it that the kids don't even get to the decoding line? No, no. I, again, I, I think they do get to the decoding line. The, the, the problem, and we started to talk about this and either we got diverted by technical problems or maybe right. I diverted myself as I sometimes do. The, 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 the problem with the Calkins method, and I don't mean to single her out unfairly, yeah. a lot of folks adopt this. I mean, you know, on the shelf behind me is a ton of books that are dedicated yeah. to, to teaching, I would say badly. And, and I mean, school teaching scores and, you know, the general feel about it, the, you know, it sucked for the 20 years prior to her kind of yeah, yeah, becoming yeah, yeah. influential. So. But I, I think, and Anna, I, I, a lot of this conversation would be broadly oversimplifying. And here's another example. We have this idea that is still dominant, um, and Lucy's the poster child for this in many ways. That reading comprehension is a skill that right. you can that that you can practice comprehension strategies and skills the same way you could practice riding a bike or throwing a ball, and that's simply not so. It, it's heavily dependent on background knowledge and vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, a a Calkins advocate, you would say as long as the kids are reading, well, let's let's engage them. Let's make sure that the that they're reading stuff about their interests, about their lives, you know, right. and, and that will, as long as they're practicing the skill of, of, of reading, then, then they're going to become better readers. There's a grain of truth to that. I mean, the, and it has to do with a lot of technical stuff about how even the language of children's books has more rare and unique words than, 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 than our conversation as college graduates, mm -hmm. for example. So there's, there's something there. Um, but, but uh, you know, again, you have to read broadly because of, um, you know, you have to build schema, you have to build vocabulary, and you're unlikely to do that if all you're ever doing is reading about your own experiences and interests. Worse, Nick, you get kind of a false positive. You know, you, you, you can see kids doing what feels like fairly sophisticated comprehension work when it's about topics they know, but when the test comes and yeah. they, they're suddenly reading about a subject they don't know, it's as if their brain has fallen out of their head and you think as a teacher, right. what happened? We worked on these yeah. skills. It's like, but they're not a skill at all. Yeah, it's, this it's, is, it's there's a lot of, science. yeah, there's a lot of domain specific knowledge, right? Which right. is, and I, I think about this, I don't know if you guys have seen Glass Onion, but uh, and oh, I'll, I'll wrap me? that in, but you know, there's a Elon Musk style billionaire who's yeah. kind of an idiot. And, you know, what I think is right, and there's a French sociologist named Pierre Bourdieu who talked about uh, cultural capital, but that what happens constantly is that people who have success in one area, say making a billion dollars in business because they're really good at selling widgets or a certain type of food or something like that, they start to think, well, I'm brilliant in this yeah. field. So when I start discoursing about public policy or about nutrition oh. or whatever, or celebrities who are really fucking good at making movies, you know, start telling you about like, you know, what you should eat or what kinds of, you know, rocks you should shove up your vagina. <laughs> like it's all equal to them because they're brilliant. So everything yeah. they do is brilliant. And in a way, our public school, not our public school system, our school system uh, has gravitated more and more to oh. tell kids, you are a genius. You are so smart. Everything you do is kind of smart. Um, Look, and and I, I, that's the main specific stuff, like I know some things really well, and then I can kind of fake it because yeah. there are certain kinds of matrices of understanding or analysis that you can play everywhere. But man, you know, it's like you got to know something to know what it's about. No question. Look, there, there was a fantastic paper uh, written. Uh, Dan Willingham, my, my, my buddy, who's a cognitive scientist at the University of Virginia, loves to talk about this. Best, best paper ever. Um, it was, the title was, Could Steven Spielberg Manage the Yankees? And the, and the yep. answer is no. You know, you're a creative right. genius, but you're a creative genius filmmaker. So, and, and inter and look, this is this is a really an important point. If you think about the things that we talk about all the time as the desired ends of schooling, oh, we don't we don't want kids to be you know compliance driven automatons. We want them to be problem solvers and communicators and collaborators and critical thinkers. Well, those are all domain specific things. Right. You know, just like Steven Spielberg couldn't manage the Yankees. 
Um, you can't be, you can't make kids all purpose, critical thinkers and problem solvers. All of this stuff is, is, is domain specific. You know, we, you and I could not ha have this conversation, you know, and, and, and come up with insightful, in, you know, insights into yeah. fields we just don't know. Having said that, and this is kind of taking us far afield from the, the kind of juicier topics we can talk about, there is something, and I, you know, uh, as an undergrad, I was a psychology major, which is to say I know less about psychology than people who were English majors, which I also <laughs> was. But, um, you know, I, I worked with a lot of people who were heavily influenced by Jean Piaget, who, mm -hmm. you know, most of his work is questionable because he yeah. like observed his own kids in the 15 minutes when his wife wasn't taking care of them and generated these theories. But there's some stuff to be gained from that. And part of it is that if you know what works in the domain, you're, you, you are specific and you can start to abstract certain kind of idea, you know, basic best practices of critical thinking or critical inquiry. And that's part of what education is about, right? Is that become competent at this one thing. And then let's start moving into other areas. And you can bring some of the skills like sociology you know, like if you bring a sociological approach to literature, that's kind of interesting. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't also know literary history, et cetera, and, uh, you know, vice versa. But um, I yeah. feel like we're in kind of in, in the miasma of kind of educational discussion. And in, unfortunately, in education schools, a lot of the times there isn't enough attention paid to the idea that, you know, you got to learn the canon or you got to learn the, the, you know, what this discourse community really believes. Yeah. Um, to be expert at that. And then yeah. maybe you can find novel insights in other areas. But, you know, let's be epistemologically humble and figure we got a lot well, of learning to do. Well, well said. We do this all the time in education. Like, we're not going to teach history. We're going to teach you to think like a historian. We're not going to teach you science. Yeah. We're going to teach you to, you know, to, 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 to think like a scientist. And that just becomes history and science appreciation. You don't actually. And I, wa I want to turn it over to Zach for a second, but just I want because I want to you know, uh, bring up the fact that you have a very Italian last name. Um, <laughs> and my mother was very Italian. And, uh, you know, I, I, we were talking before our grandparents came over roughly the same time in the 19 teens. My mother and my father, who's the son of Irish immigrants, uh, grew up in New York in Manhattan and Brooklyn. They, to the to their dying days in the 90s, they could tell me that, you know, bauxite was the third, you know, most uh, uh, valuable commodity mined out of Montana, et cetera. Like, they yeah. grew up in the golden age of, you know, American public schools as the, uh, you know, the, the place, the melting pot and where you learn knowledge and there wasn't all this bullshit. And like, you know, yeah. they, you know, the teachers told you you were all stupid and would amount to nothing. And, and I, you know, can you rescue, like, can you talk a little bit about that? Because what they, they were taught a lot of facts yeah. that stuck with them. I mean, like 70 years later, 50, 60 years later. But they were not taught any analytics. They were not taught any, you know, it didn't appear, at least from the way they talked about stuff. They were not educated beyond, you know, yeah. grammar school and high school. But so, I mean, like, as bad as education is now, is it worse than what it was when we look back and say, like, oh, that <sighs> was the heyday? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be that guy who says, well, back in the day. But I, I, I do think there's some wisdom to that, um, that that. And I think it's, you know, it's almost as if that we think, you know, that that it's like education search for the Northwest Passage that doesn't exist. Right. We're going to find a shortcut to these things. Um, and, and it's a false dichotomy, but I think as a practical matter, it's a real one. Every time we think, no, we're just going to teach these skills, it's at the expense of knowledge. You know, yeah. whose knowledge? Oh, you can just Google it. Well, no, you can't. You can't use those right. tools effectively without a certain amount of background knowledge. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we 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 were good at this and then lost our way, even if we were good at it accidentally, you know, it was probably, you'd probably be better off. Um, I mean, nobody wants, you know, the grad grind school where, you know, yeah. the battle of Hastings, you know, that, that, that like you see in old, you know, English movies. Yeah. Um, but I mean, it, it, an education that is content rich, that is knowledge rich at the expense of these higher order thinking skills would, I'm not saying it's good, but if you had to choose a school that just, tried thought that it could teach one and failed and one that made no no attempt to you'd probably back your way into more educated people by by ignoring them altogether uh, and let me be clear i am not advocating that but i'm right. just answering the question that you posed yeah no thank you zach what is the uh, role of 
you know, we, you're talking about test scores a little bit earlier. The, I'm just going to display a couple of the trends <laughs> over time here. This is uh, it's a dead from, man's EKG you got up there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the, it, totally flat. Uh, I think it's a actually, remarkable weight level for a late middle aged <laughs> man. I don't know. I'm impressed by that. Yeah, you see a, a very slight incline and then a uh, kind of reversion in recent years. That's the what we call the pandemic learning loss. Um, yeah. This is for mathematics. These are national. Uh, math scores. Uh, this is um, reading. Uh, same same story. What yeah. uh, and, call the code? Um, He's flatlined. Yeah. <laughs> what is the role of of test of testing in in general and, and how it shapes Ooh. the education system? Like how how focused should we be yeah. on on these numbers? Um, and especially when we're talking about school choice, because yeah. um, the the data on that and, and maybe you can I know you're steeped in it, so you can talk about you know what effect do charter schools have on on it. I mean, there's mm -hmm. this is just one study I pulled from Education Next, which is generally a pro charter organization and showing that uh, in districts that have charter schools in them, there's um, a slight improvement in in scores across right. the district, even in, in the in the public schools. Um, it's 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 a modest effect, though. Yeah. Um, do, and, and there is earlier work that shows in urban districts where there's a lot of Catholic schools that provided competition, that that kind of boosts yeah. every everybody ups their game a little right. bit when, when there's more. When there's more choice involved, where there are more options, it seems like it has a positive effect. On and I mean, your your book is is about Success Academy, which yeah. is very focused on that and does achieve uh, pretty remarkable results. This one, um, you know, very famous and uh, controversial charter network. But you know, there's questions about like system wide, what yeah. what would the effect be on? Is that something that like how concerned should people like us who who are you know pro school choice be with those numbers and or or are there other things beyond that we should be thinking about yeah those are two very different um uh, veins of or to mine but we uh -huh. let, let's let's put a pin briefly in testing and come back to it what i what i the one thing i want to say about testing is i'm not anti-testing at all um uh but it but it's it's had, it's had a very complicated effect on school curriculum and culture mm -hmm. And nobody should sentimentalize the days before testing. Um, it, has, it has not been an un, uh, unalloyed good. Um, it's, it's resulted in a lot of bad practice. Like some of these practices we were discussing earlier are incentivized by, by, by misconceiving. This is, there is definitely, we, we all have either have kids in the educational system, K through 12 or higher ed, or we've all had kids. Um, teaching to the test is real and it's spectacular. I don't know. Yeah, and by but, that, I by that by that I mean it. It 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 is absolutely a focus. Uh, oh, but it's no not question. clear that yeah. trying to do well on whatever test we're talking about really has anything to do with making your kid, you know, more educated. If, if, if the, the bromide is, is it a test worth test worth teaching to? I I, I can yeah. see my way to teaching to the test in math because that really can be skills driven. In reading, it probably does more harm than good. Let's mm -hmm. come back to that if we must. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to be a jerk on the charter school stuff because since I'm, you know, since you know I'm pro charter, I'm pro choice. I get kind of aggravated by the, these distinctions. You know, when you when you compare charter results to, to 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 district schools, because frankly, as an educator, knowing if a school is a charter or a district school tells me absolutely nothing of value. Like, what's happening inside of that charter? What's happening inside of that of that district school? Are they teaching Lucy Calkins? Are they teaching? Is it a core knowledge school? Is it a classical school? Is it Montessori? Mm -hmm. It tells me absolutely nothing of value. So, I mean, you, you could make the case, and, and you know that that you know charters with with their in theory. Here we go again. Mm -hmm. Charters, by dint of the fact that they are free to you know hire and fire, they're non-union. They can you know they they can you know make better choices uh, about curriculum, etc. I want to know what the decisions they're making because, to be really honest, there's no excuse for charters to be a little bit better. They should be a yeah. lot better. So let me ask a, a kind of the same question from a slightly different angle. If you look at uh, parental satisfaction of schools, traditional assignment public schools are here, uh, char public schools of choice are here, and then private schools are up here. Yeah. Um, and that seems pretty ambiguous. Is parental satisfaction the main measure that we should use in evaluating and then to make that more complicated, 
How do parents know? And I say this as, you know, no, my I just want, are we going to have any easy questions today? Nick? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> my ex-wife and I are both PhDs and we, you know, our kids went to uh, K through 12 uh, public schools, mostly in, uh, in Southwestern Ohio. And we were like, I don't have, you know, you get the state report card, blah, 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 and on the school district, which is kind of good to have. But like, we had no fucking idea. Like when our kids came home with books to learn how to read or to do math, like, I don't know how to evaluate that. So my question right. is, is parental satisfaction the, you know, the kind of ultimate yardstick? And how does that relate to just getting meaningful information about whether or not, it, what a school is doing and whether or not it's effective? It's, it, it is a better um, yardstick than many of the others, maybe even mm. most of the others. You know, it's, it's something I always say about school choice is like when people say, does school choice work and they compare test scores, like, well, here's my barometer for does school choice work. Yeah. Did you get to choose? Do you like your choice? If the answer to bo both of those questions is yes, then school choice works for you. Um, the, here, I'm going to make another comment yeah. that will put me in bad odor with our choice friends. Um, we like to say among choice folks that, you know, parents should be in control of their money. Well, it's not just their money. You know, I, I pay taxes to the Greenville School District, even though my daughter is 24 years old and never spent a day in, in Greenville, New York schools. I still have a literal vested interest. I wrote, just wrote the yeah. check. You know, so, so it's it, we're putting parents in control of our money. So from an accountability question, are parents a better are, are better um, uh, levers of accountability right. than test scores? Yeah, probably because they've got the well, and certainly for their kids, for, for their, their kids, kids, but not that's for right. my tax dollars necessarily. That's, that's exactly Those right. Things. So it's it's you you're not going to have a perfect accountability system by saying either trust test scores, trust parents. It, it's it's always going to have to be some kind of you know informed push and pull between the various stakeholders in public education. And if that, and then again, we if that also, makes me a bad choice a proponent, then I'm a bad choice proponent. If, if I may also, just to make it more complicated still, you know, part of education and certainly K through 12, it's not about, you know, book learning or anything like that. It's, it's about, you know, these vaguely determined uh, morals uh, questions or yeah. the culture that I want for my kid. Yep. My parents, although they literally couldn't afford it uh, and I ended up paying for part of it, uh, they sent me to a bad, uh, series of parochial schools, including a high school in Middletown, New Jersey, modern day that went out of business, mm. uh, you know, because it, it sucks up at it recently went out of business. But, you know, they would say, we wanted you to have those values. And yeah. then, you know, when it comes to school choice, especially in the K through 12 thing, how do we, you know, how do we, how do we talk about that? And how do we factor that in? Um, yeah, you know, like, how, you know, because Part of the, the promise of charter schools and of a broad school choice, certainly with backpack funding or ESAs, is that there is going to be a Kung Fu Academy, uh, you know, <laughs> where your kid will get, you know, he'll graduate, he'll be able to read or she'll be able to read and write and do arithmetic and she's going to have a black belt in Taekwondo or something like that. And yeah. that might be great. I mean, actually, I would love that. I would love to see like a bunch of different schools saying we're going to we're going to teach your kids, you know, basic stuff and we're going to route it around sports or, sure. you know, science projects or whatever, yeah. um, or moral instruction. So but look, how it, do we, it, it, how do we account for all that kind of, I, 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 for what it's worth, uh, I'm not sure if this is how you intend this, but this to me is a much better argument for choice than test scores. Mm -hmm. In other words, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I, and again, I don't, I don't want to say I'm blithe about test scores because I want kids, all kids to learn how to read period, full stop. Um, but it frustrates me that we never make that argument that you tacitly just made in favor of choice. The argument we tend to make is, oh, unions suck, demand choice, uh, or, yeah. or uh, your local school is terrible, demand choice. Wouldn't it be a more potent argument to say, look, mom and dad, nothing wrong with, with your local district school, but maybe you'd like a classical school, or maybe you'd mm -hmm. like Kung Fu Academy, or you know, maybe there's a thousand different flavors of curriculum and instruction, one of which might be more interesting to your child rather than having them sit there bored all day. That, that to me is just a richer argument for choice than test scores bad, choice good. Right. That, and and the, just a demonization of unions as this kind of, you know, we don't have the Soviet Union to kick around anymore. Yeah, we have um, I, and and I say this, I have a, a bunch of friends who taught in public schools, uh, mostly in New Jersey, and they were union members and they yeah. paid their dues and they were glad to have the union uh, on certain levels, but they also were like, God, this union sucks. So, yeah. you know, I mean, we're ail I think as choice proponents, uh, and I'm not necessarily saying you, Robert, I, I speak for myself here. 
um, you know, we're probably needlessly alienating oh, teachers goodness. who oh, are oh, oh. suffering are almost as much as the kids. Yeah. I, I just finished a 5,000 word piece for national affairs that will come out in a couple of weeks that makes precisely that argument. Um, I, I guess because I got bored of sticking my thumb in choice eyes. Now I'm sticking my, eyes, my, my thumbs in conservatives eyes. Um, you know, I work at AEI. This is dangerous. Yeah. Where, where, They're going to uh, where... ship you off to their uh, satellite <laughs> campus in uh, the green zone in They're Baghdad. They're going to piss off everybody yeah. before I'm done. But I, I mean this earnestly. I mean, another thing that we tend to forget as choice people, or, uh, you know, in my case, as, as, as somebody more right than left, um, you know, the vast majority of American children go to public schools and they always will, at least in my yeah, lifetime. Yeah. You know, so 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 it doesn't make any sense to undermine these places, um, to 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 turn parents against yep. them. I mean, maybe I've been reading Yuval Levin too long, but I'm kind of an institutionalist, and I'm interested in public schools because that's where the kids are. So we we can't uh, it can't be in anyone's interest to crap all over them and and delegitimize them. You know, we should. And again, you can be a choice person without withdrawing your interest in, in the public schools. I think it's just kind of, and also if your argument for that, we haven't touched on this, but if your argument, you hear this from some guys at the Cato Institute is, is oh, this is the solution to the culture war. Well, then if you, if everybody who feels one way about culture war issues exits the public school system, you're concentrating their effects among the vast majority of American children who are left behind. That doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. And just to put some numbers on it, uh, you know, I, I have a video that went up yesterday uh, about uh, kind of fictional schools of choice that we all wanted to attend. But it's about uh, less than 25 percent of American students go to some school of choice, whether it's a, a public charter school or a magnet school, mm -hmm. something that they choose to go home school, private school, all of that. It's uh, it's like a little bit more than 75 percent is. Uh, or I'm sorry, yeah, uh, because the chosen public school, like, there's homeschooling, et cetera. But it's like overwhelmingly, most kids are still going to residential assignment schools. And, yep. uh, you know, that's where the money is. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and that's where the kids are. I mean, I can't be more yeah. emphatic about that. The kids these, are money. Let's face it. You know, one OK, way but I'm not sorry. I'm not yeah. cynical enough to just look at kids and yeah. see dollar signs. I see the kids who will be paying into Social Security, who will be fighting our wars, who will be yeah. building our industries, et cetera. The, the idea that we should wash our hands of our oh, future. No, no, is, you know, uh, no, uh, not at all. I, I'm joking, but Zach? Okay. Well, I, I was just going to say, first of all, let me just say that uh, on a personal level, what you were saying earlier, I, I resonate with that in terms of it being just really appealing that there's this kind of increasing menu of options that fit different lifestyles. I mean, I see it in my neighborhood. I live in Florida, which has a lot of school choice. In mm -hmm. my neighborhood, there's a pretty good neighborhood school that's a technology magnet. My kids go to a kind of like artsy, like Waldorf inspired school, which I'm sure you would think has total like cr garbage curriculum. But I like it. No, I, I would great. think you would like the, the Waldorf. Yeah, I, I, right? I, yeah no, I, I don't I don't yeah. I don't li like it or dislike it. It's but perfectly it, fine. It, I, the Waldorf you know, schools it, are better than the Waldorf salad. I just want to say that. <laughs> I'm, a, I, I'm a huge Rudolf Steiner fan, but that's that's for a different live stream. I, right? I, I like it because the of um, they're like consciously very like tactile and like, yeah. like sort of yeah. anti-technology and the kids get enough screen time like outside of school. So I don't and want they them also to go home and have, have rich con dinner table conversations with college graduates, which also builds language yeah. proficiency. By right. The way. Right. And then like right across the street from that is like a, 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 a science magnet, a STEM yeah. magnet. That's, you know, kind of the opposite approach. So it's kind of, there's a kind of beauty to seeing everyone yeah. be yeah. able to like, access all these different things that that work best for them um and, and i agree that that's kind of like the even more powerful argument yeah. for choice is there, than just is, is there a butt coming school. zach what's that there's a butt coming isn't there you're gonna say but <laughs> uh no no I, there, there there's no butt coming no. i i wanted the 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 well the objection that i want to levy at you was to the idea that we still need to be heavily invested in kind of the culture war uh wrangling over curriculum um beca because hmm. because so many kids are in public school i mean uh, you know th these are this is just some data uh, uh historical data about the, about the rise in um charter school enrollment yeah. and you know there's been a slow but steady upward drive mm -hmm. you've documented in in your work robert that um you know post pandemic there's been a accelerate accelerated you know exodus out of the public yeah. system. 
I, I part of me just feels like the more that uh, libertarians engage in like, well, what should the state determine the curriculum be, the more we are kind of uh, impeding that 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 process or mm. that progress towards well, uh, okay. a more... but, but can I just push back a little bit yeah. on that? I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree with you, but I, I, I'm starting to feel like my libertarian credentials were in pretty good order until we became school choice advocates. Yeah. And, and now I feel, and I, and I tease my friend Neil McCluskey about this, who who is you know I've, who's I've at the Cato school. Institute, yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and and he's written um, uh, a lot about you know how how school choice is the antidote to to to, to culture wars. And mm -hmm. first I say, well, you know, schools are the original culture war yeah. fronts. You know, we argue yeah, about I, and, 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 and and just to dump on him I, right away. Yeah, please. Go I, I don't want to. Let me just finish. Yeah. You know, and, and I mean like. You're assuming if you if you absent yourself from this conversation, you're assuming that the vast majority of American kids who are left behind the public system are, are going to always value personal liberty the way that you do. And so I, what I tease Neil with is saying, you know, I don't want to read your future book about gulag choice, you know, because it, it could come to that. In other words, you're you know, you, you are assuming that that the, the, the eternal values of American society will always be in place and they don't need stewardship. And I don't think that's right. That's, I mean, I was going to say that, uh, you know, I, I think about this uh, completely in terms of religious freedom. You know, we have, ton yeah, and America has always been famous for having lots of different religions and subsects within, you know, Christianity, within Catholicism, within, you know, Judaism, et cetera. And that doesn't diminish culture war battles over no. religion. What it does is it stops the violence over warring factions of religion. And if we, yeah. I, I look forward to a day when everybody is going to a school of choice, not because it means we yeah. won't be arguing over what is right and proper or effective or the center of America, but we'll have richer conversations because people That's don't have to, you know, you don't get stuck <clears throat> doing something else. And uh, uh, Martin Morse Wooster, a, a longtime Reason contributor and author who wrote a great book called Angry Classrooms, Vacant Minds. He died recently. This was from about 20 or 25 years ago. It had a great history of the Philadelphia school riots mm -hmm. in the pre-Civil War era where the, uh, you know, the wasps who ran the Philadelphia establishment, it, it was a big Catholic town and they forced Catholic schools to use the King James Bible. And it was mm -hmm. this, you know, the people died in the ensuing struggle. That's yeah. ultimately on, on a certain level, the libertarian emphasis on choice. I think it's like, okay, it takes the violence out of the system, including the violence of sending your kids to a school with whom, with whose curricula you kind of disagree with fundamentally. Yeah. I think that's good, but it's not going to stop these conversations. But yeah. perhaps to bring it back to uh, something that Zach uh, was getting at as well is, you know, when you talk about a core curriculum, um, like who who would decide that in, you know, and, and let's say, you know, 75% or, you know, 70% of kids are going to be going to residential assigned schools in the state or the, you know, the state and the local school boards are going to be kind of calling the shots and the feds a little mm -hmm. bit too. But, you know, it's kind of interesting to question like, okay, well, who's history? Because at some point you've only got, you know, you've, you've got like 40 actual full school days in the year. They're always kind of nickel and diving it down. But like, you know, you can teach, uh, you know, Zach grew up in Florida. So it's like, okay, Ponce de, Le Ponce de Leon is in, but then maybe, yep. uh, you know, the Rosewood massacre of a black town. Well, that's out because that's, yeah. you know, that's problematic. And then, you know, something about how orange juice is like the fucking greatest beverage ever is in. <laughs> Walt Disney is a god. No, but I mean, like, don't, doesn't it make sense really from a operational level to, if the state is going to dictate certain outcomes, you know, those be minimal. And if it's going to dictate certain books and things like that, that really should be pretty small. Yeah, I think that's probably right. Um, and and for what it's worth, and, and I'm going to be a little bit mealy-mouthed on this, I think it's more important mm -hmm. to, to build these uh, foundations in the elementary years so mm -hmm. you can have these rich debates in, say, middle school and high school. Um, so I'm, I'm probably a lot more interested in being prescriptive to the degree I'm interested at all in K to 5, maybe K to 8, but not in, not in high school. Um, you know, so, I, I, so, but I mean, look, you know, we, we have a mechanism for the, for adjudicating these debates right now, Nick, and you just alluded to it. We've got 13,000 school boards. We've got 50 right. states. 
And if hey, that's you not know, the solution, we, but in 1950, we had like 114,000 school districts. Yeah. You know, uh, more, so it, more, it, like yeah. in, a, in a bizarre way, uh, you know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, the consolidation and centralization of education in America, like from, you know, after World War II was immense yeah. and phenomenal. And that's also not a bad thing, too, because like most of those school districts, you know, were probably absolutely, you know, de jure segregated. And they also sure. probably had, uh, you know, our uh, reason science correspondent, Ron Bailey, grew up in Virginia in the uh, 60s, uh, I guess, late 50s and early 60s. And he showed us, uh, some of us on Slack, his he had his uh, elementary school history book. And it was literally filled with happy slaves who weren't called wow. slaves either. Wow. You know, they were like happy farm hands or something. And it's like, wow, like that, that is an argument for like, I don't want anybody to be in control because yeah. the possibility of system failure yeah. uh, is really bad. And, you know, yeah. Zach, do, you, do we want to talk now, uh, given where, you know, you're in Florida about yeah. the African-American uh, yeah. studies AP yeah. course, like, yeah. How does that factor into any well, of this? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I wanted to ask both of you your reaction to that, this specific example, which is that here in Florida, um, Ron DeSantis um, uh, banned a AP African-American yeah. uh, studies or history course. Um, I, I have a, a clip here uh, that I'll, I'll pull up of him in a second explaining why he thought that was necessary. Um, but this is kind of part of his broad campaign to, quote unquote, de-wokeify uh, Florida schools. Um, and, you know, uh, Robert, I'd like to get into your thoughts of what has happened to uh, the kind of public school curricula. You, you call it uh, the pedagogy of the depressed. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to talk about like how we got there at, at some point and, and what your analysis is of you know, uh, why it's a problem. But first, let me just play this clip of DeSantis and get your reaction. DeSantis said teaching black history is required in Florida schools, but added this course amounted to indoctrination. This course on black history, what are one of, what's one of the lessons about? Queer theory. Now, who would say that an important part of black history is queer theory. That is somebody pushing an agenda on our kids. And so when you look to see they have stuff about intersectionality, abolishing prisons, that's a political agenda. Um, and then th this is from uh, NBC News uh, obtained the uh, the course material. Yeah. Uh, I think, it, you know, the what he's objecting to seems to be, you know, like in unit four, you can see things like, uh, the black feminist movement, womanism and intersectionality, um, I don't know, black lives today, anti-colonial movements and military service. I don't know. Uh, I guess like my, my general sense is, you know, this is a high school AP class. You can kind of opt into it or not if you like. I, I don't know why the governor needs to weigh in, but what, you know, what, what do you think of Wait, the? Why, why the did president? the governor weigh in? Because uh, uh, am I reading the constitution incorrectly, or is 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 education no longer uh, under state control? Hmm. Uh, okay. So that's so, why he's doing it. Well, I mean, I'm yeah. sure he's got political reasons for it, but right, right. I, 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 and again, yeah, I, I, I don't want to sound blithe here, but I mean, I'm surprised when people are surprised about things like this. So I mean, I, I don't know. Look, look, let me yeah. just say, I don't know that I'm I'm not necessarily questioning his constitutional authority to do so. I'm, I'm questioning the wisdom of yeah. a governor kind of micromanaging what can be in high school curricula or, or not. Um, I mean, is that. Yeah, I, well, and, and I'm not trying to to, to gainsay mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. because, again, as I keep saying, I'm a choice guy. OK, mm -hmm. I'm a choice guy. I, I'm mo much more concerned in American education with the opposite problem of having classroom teachers feeling that they are free as public employees, as state actors, to close the door and teach whatever the hell they want. Okay, mm -hmm. I think that I'm, I'm not, neither one yeah. of these are, are, are good uh, things to have, but I think the, the, the problem of no curriculum, of indulging your priors, of viewing your job as, no, I'm not a teacher, I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an activist. I, I think that's a, a bigger problem, particularly insofar as it, is it, it, is it, it damages trust in public education. Suffice what, to say, I'm, I'm not asking for Walmart schools, but I do no, think that yeah. whether you live in Florida, Ohio, New York, or anywhere else, there should be a certain kind of reasonable set of expectations about the, the, the content of your kid's education that are met regardless of where you are. So, I mean, in like, say, K through eight uh, education, is that a big problem that 
the teachers, you know, they get a curriculum and they shut the door and they say, hey, we're not teaching this. I'm just going to, you know, free write about your experience. No, that's not the problem at all. The bigger problem is there's no curriculum whatsoever. Serious. I mean, and when you say that, like, you know, they don't get assigned textbooks or they no. don't get assigned worksheets and things no, like let, that. Let's take this back to what we were saying at the top about yeah. reading instruction. I, I, and um, stop me if I've told you this story before, Nick, but one of my first days in the classroom, my, my Lucy Calkins uh, uh, professional development staffer, when I said, what am I supposed to teach? She said, well, Mr. Pondicio, you're the best person to know what every child needs. And I thought she was making fun of me. Okay. <laughs> but but, but, yeah. but what, she, what she meant was that you're here to teach the skill of reading and what you choose is, well, what you pick text so that will what, engage what your year, child. What year was that? And that's in, in the New York City. 2003, 2003. Yeah. And the New York City ago. School District, which is the yeah. largest school district in the country. Um yeah. And, you know, and so you went into class and they weren't like, here's the textbook, here's the reader, here's, hmm. you know, the C. Oh, no. Dick Run book or whatever. And like, you can start you had with a classroom that. library and I was to teach the skill, you know, of reading yeah. and writing. So to, to, today, you know, I would I would model for my students, you know, when yeah. good readers read, they notice what characters say. Now, right. in the books that you're reading, notice what the characters say. And, and, and this is my point about teaching reading as a skill. OK, right. Uh, well, you're not teaching any set text whatsoever. There's the, the mini lesson, the skill du jour, then kid 24 kids, 24 books. They go off and practice the skill, which isn't a skill at all, independently. Right. Part of the point of uh, charter schools er early on was the, the experimentation would supposedly develop some best practices that then could be applied um, in the public mm -hmm. schools or not the public schools in the district schools. To what extent has that happened? Um, I mean, you know, again, Success Academy mm -hmm. is an example yeah. of one network where they've gotten pretty remarkable results. Have district schools learned from anything from the successful charters and applied them in their curricula? Not enough. And and at the risk of getting down into the weeds, you know, since you, you kindly alluded to my book, I mean, that was the that was the reason I wrote that book, because I wanted to spend a year in this extremely high performing charter district and say, OK, what are the lessons here that we can apply to K-12 at large? In other words, do what we were supposed to be yeah. doing. Good news, bad news. The bad news was I didn't find a whole lot of lessons. Um, that's the, that's the bad news. The good news is 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 one of the lessons that I think, and this may have been confirmation bias on my part, but what I really liked and I think really is applicable to K twelve, whether it's a school choice, school of choice, or or a district school, is the way they conceived of the role of the teacher. Um, the, the, and I did this as a teacher as well. You spend an ungodly amount of time when you don't have a curriculum crafting lessons on your own, going on Google and Pinterest and looking for you know lessons. Or, or materials to you know, yeah. engage and interest your kids. And, and that time, that is time I'm not spending getting to know my kids, looking at their work, becoming expert in the curriculum, building a relationship with families, all of these other things that, that yield more value. At Success Academy, they, they have a curriculum. They've got the, 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 their, their preparation time is what they call intellectual preparation, preparing to teach the lesson, not creating it from scratch. So that creates more bandwidth to do all of those other things. I mean, I, I don't think that's the only reason success mm -hmm. kind of blows the doors off standardized testing, but the conception they have of what a teacher's job is and what a teacher's job is not uh, is one of those things yeah. that I think schools. Well, the, the other thing that you found, I mean, the, the, the big takeaway, the, the kind of headline uh, controversy making was that uh, success is not skimming good students. That's the that's the charge that's lobbed at all successful charter schools. Yeah. But it's that it, it really selects for highly motivated parents. And that's a big de facto. Issue. I mean, you, yeah. you can't you literally cannot handpick families, but they yeah. create any number of mechanisms that make it more yeah. likely that active engaged families right. will persist. Yes. Um, so, OK, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just yeah. saying, can we return to this question of what has happened to curricula beyond mm -hmm the problems with basics like reading and arithmetic. Yeah. Um, you penned this article in commentary, the unbearable bleakness of schooling. And you write there that uh, this pedagogy of the depressed, uh, America the problematic, is thought to be a virtue among professional educators who view it as a mark of seriousness and sophistication. We want children to grapple with, quote, honest history, close quote, starting in elementary school and to discover the power of their voices by writing authentic essays about their personal problems. Um, what What is the pedagogy of the depressed um, and how did this overtake, or what to what degree did it overtake 
the curricula in, in public schools and, and how did it happen? Yeah, or well, the pedagogy of the depressed, as Nick will appreciate, is kind of a little inside joke, um, you know, because all of us as teachers had to study Paolo Freire and his book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Mm -hmm. So this was just my having a little bit of a, of, of a laugh at, at that and tw turning it on its ear. Um, but, you know, I, I think you could write a really good book about education, about, you know, how, how we are sometimes wrong for all the right reasons. And, and this is a, a, a good example of that. So is the reading curriculum. Like who, who thinks kids shouldn't be engaged by what they read? Of course they should. But then you're missing yeah. something profound. So, so, you know, it makes a lot of sense that, you, oh, you should challenge kids. You, you should make the curriculum about them. They should write about things that matter to them. They should learn about problems in the world so they are you know, inspired to, to do their part, to build a more perfect union. All of these things sound, you know, engaging and exciting. And as adults, it's, you know, this is what we do all day. This sounds great. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I do worry that for children, it's overwhelming, you know, that, that, that the, the world begins to appear to them as nothing more than just, it, it's all bad and broken. And, and wait a minute, you're asking me I'm, to fix this? I'm 12. You know, where, where are the grownups? What, 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 what's your role in all this? So I, I don't want to overstate the problem, but but nor do I want to understate the problem. You know, yes, we want students to be problem solvers, but that doesn't mean that educators should be problem fetishizers. And and I think that's what's happening. What here. what are the specific, you know, uh, you know, what is the core curriculum, the kind of cultural literacy of depression that is being taught? Is it, um, you know, is it that America was founded, you know, as a white supremacist, uh, you know, club med or something? Is it that <laughs> the environment that the planet, you know, that that the planet is irredeemable, it's it's burned to a crisp, but you still got to, you know, separate your plastics and paper? I mean, what what are the what are the lessons that are being taught? Yeah, and again, I, I don't want to overstate that, but I do think that we yeah. are erring on the side of of painting a picture of the world as as bad and broken. And you just cited some mm -hmm. of the examples, you know, like oh, the the the, the planet's going to be uninhabitable in twelve years. Wait, right. I'm twelve. That's going to be a problem. Um, you know, you look at the world of young adult literature, all this stuff that is supposed to be engaging and interesting to kids. Well, you know, it, it, sometimes it's like those old, you know, uh, TV movies of the week where, you know, the, the, the pathology du jour. I mean, it's, right. it's all about, you know, drug use and sexual abuse and racism and whatnot. I mean, it's, it's just, it, 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 I don't think I'm, I, I'm wrong to suggest that we, we are sometimes guilty of presenting kids a view of the world that is awfully dark. We are uh, oftentimes, and I'm, when I say we, Robert, I'm going to include you in this, baby boomers have internalized and are projecting out anxieties uh, in yeah, a way that's well that maybe maybe our <clears throat> parents' generation was a little bit more stoic, uh, you know, in a lot of ways. Um, oh, no. Look, I, you, you and I are roughly the same age, Nick. And in yeah. that commentary piece, I think I, I, I wrote about this. Think of the world in which we grew up. OK, I grew up on Long Island. I can't remember where, where you grew up. I, uh, well, I'm sorry. Will speak slower. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and so, I grew up so, in New Jersey, so this is like you so know, the we were test of, of you know toxic dump sites. Think of the world the of, the, of, of the late '60s, early '70s. Okay, yeah. um, th there was it was a time of tremendous unrest. You think it's yeah. bad now in terms of political unrest? In, in Brian Burroughs' book *Days of Rage*, he chronicled mm -hmm. 1,900 domestic bombings in a single year. I think 1971. Yeah. Can you imagine if that was happening pollution, right now? Pollution was through the roof. The economy was in the shitter. My, my uh, dad was, know, a, was the metric for the airlines. System, the metric <laughs> system was about to be imposed. My, my mean, dad worked for the airlines, good. and, and the, the, the news was filled with you know hijackings and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't have the sense that I lived in a dangerous... The Vietnam War was going on for... Yeah, for yeah. Nuclear annihilation was like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Did, did you yeah. have the sense that the world was somehow... I did not. You know, no, no. Dangerous? I... No, no. If anything, it was you know, no, not at all. Well, well, well yeah. why is that? I'm not saying yeah. that I have the answer, but I'm I'm very curious yeah. about what change in American life and culture that we grew up in what, by comparison to today, genuinely unsettled yeah. and dangerous times. But it, but it, we didn't have that sense as kids. Now things are, you know, look. I'm sorry. There, there's never been a more prosperous, better time to be alive. Right. If you look at by every reasonable measure of of human happiness than now, and we think things have never been worse. And somehow we think yeah. kids are immune from this. Come on. Yeah, uh, you know the one thing I'll I'll say though, um, it does seem as if, uh, and you know maybe this is off base, but that the the typical school now seems to be teaching toward a history of grievance which is rich and meaningful, but 
for blacks, for uh, uh, lower lower income people, et cetera, and the, the difficulties that they face. I do know that you know the Catholic school that I went to taught a, an alternative history of America that I didn't realize until I went to college was pretty weird, where mm. Catholics were simultaneously the most oppressed group and also the most important and central to American history and American flourishing. So it was kind of, you know, it wasn't quite Marcus Garvey Academy or something, but it was a form <laughs> of lower middle class, which is the milieu I grew up in, of recent immigrant really Catholic yeah. heritage that was uplifting. And that was like, you know what, we fucking made it here and it's better than the, uh, than old Europe. And, you know, you got some real, you got some real, uh, you know, options in front of you, but in a way that's not all that different than maybe, you know, uh, you know, lower income black kids learning a history that is generally denied. Um, um you know, in, in the, yeah, I, I, this is one of those areas that that it, that is too volatile to paint with a broad brush. So I'm I'm, I'm not going yeah. to, but I, but I will say here's what concerns me. I mean, I you know I, I joke that my side hustle is civic education. Mm -hmm. I, I do worry about um, look if public education um, does nothing else, it ought to attach kids to civil society, right? You know, mm -hmm. regardless of your politics, regardless of your of your you know religious or ethnic uh, background. You know, if we do nothing else, kids should leave us from every school, even schools of choice at age 17 or 18, excited to get on with something. You know, I don't care if it's college, mm -hmm. military, job, whatever, but they should feel invested, you know, in their community, in their country and eager to do their part. You know, they, they, so we were talking earlier about, you know, accountability, Zach, there's your accountability. OK, yeah. kids should the, 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 and I've written about this before. It's like the, the, the only accountability that matters is if you say to kids, are you in, you know, and they and they say yeah. yes. And here's what they're excited to do. How would you so, measure so, that? Though. Can, I, can I finish this thought? Yeah. Because what I worry about and I'm, I'm, I don't natter on about grievance studies, but but if your entire history, if, if your entire K-12 education was just chock full of grievance and the bad and the broken, where's the incentive to feel like you're bought in and yeah. eager to do something? We think as teachers that it's a mark of our sophistication that we're inspiring kids to take their part and fix these things when it may have exactly the opposite effect. My AEI colleague, Yuval mm -hmm. Levin, has written about this, about, you know, about, about what, what he calls the new social disorder. And it's not an excess of passion for you know, sex and drugs and money and whatnot. It's just the opposite. It's this failure to launch. It's the why bother? I'm sitting on the couch. I'm not bought into anything. Do you have a uh, sense of how much the, the w concerns about this, especially parental concerns, are actually driving both the the exodus from public education, which you mentioned in the same article, uh, 600 school districts in nearly two dozen states found a decline of 3% in public yeah. school enrollment compared with pre-pandemic levels, including about 50,000 students gone missing in New York City, 26,000 in LA, 25,000 yeah. in Chicago, all told about 1.5 million students have exited the traditional public education. But we don't system. know why. Right? We don't know why. I mean, yeah, I, yeah go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's, it's funny you should bring this up because just two days ago, I was asking uh, uh, about this very question. Like, we know that there's been this exodus, but we know why they're leaving. And, and, and I, I can't find a good answer to it. It could be job related. It could be, um, you know, I'm, I'm dismayed with public schools. I'm going to homeschool my kid because homeschooling numbers are way up. Uh, I, I don't think we've got good data. We can make some intelligent guesses, but I don't think we've got good data about why when parents are leaving, why yeah. they've chosen to leave. I mean, another one is, uh, I mean, just from personal experience and yeah. anecdotal from, you know, living in LA through this, that's where I was when the pandemic hit, um, you know, the the going all virtual with the schools did a few things. It, first of all, it forced this sort of curriculum transparency. Yeah. Uh, secondly, yeah. getting back into it. Um, I mean, a, a big issue for me was I had a big problem with kind of the health mandates that were being imposed on my very young children. That was a big motivator for me. And I think a lot of other parents, um, whether it's, you know, ch children wearing masks outdoors out day, all day yeah. without much justification or like the threats of um, certain ma um, uh, vaccine mandates and stuff like that. Um, and then just like the general way that the teachers union was um, behaving throughout all this. Um, I, I don't know how salient that is for people who aren't as like politically engaged as me, but the fact that they were advocating to keep the schools closed until this like laundry list of demands was met 
That yeah. was all. Zach, you know, what, what are you talking about? Randy Randy Weingarten was was working very hard to reopen yeah. schools. Right. She says so yeah. herself. So, and just the unpredictability, right? I yeah, mean, in a lot of places, well. schools would be open, then they were shut, then they were Look, open no question. for two I mean, days a week for you, but three days for the other kids, et cetera. It was like a really let me see if I, if I, if I, no. That, and and we don't like to, to 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 talk about that among those of us who are like sophisticated about education. But come on, people need a safe place for their kid to be all day. Right. And, and when and so it's not just the school closures; it was the quarantines, right? Mm -hmm. So when schools reopened, then suddenly one kid tests. You know, uh, it wasn't even in your kid's class, but it was on the bus. One kid tests positive for COVID, and everybody stays home for two weeks. Um, right. That, you know, we we do kind of need schools to be reliably open or closed so we can make plans and get on with our life. Yeah, and so people um, also got a taste of trying things a different way. Some people might have mm. tried some homeschooling or they did these micro school pods. I mean, I don't know if that's contributed to people so thinking- Some people like well, remote learning, Zach. Yeah. You know, I mean, in the yeah, main, yeah. it's been a disaster, but for some families, it worked pretty well. I, how, I, yeah. Yoga, Zach. I just wonder like how much of this, um, you know, is going to last in terms of people being open to different ways of doing things. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's a great question. Yeah. Can, can, can we get together next year and answer it? Because I'm, I'm yeah. planning on spending the next year in places like Arizona and Iowa and West Virginia that are going yeah. kind of all in on ESAs. Because yeah. I think this is the real promise. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's one thing to say I've got choice and now I've even got a backpack full of cash. It's another question to say, okay, what am I going to do with it? Right. Yeah. You know, so. I brought up some um, slides here of the, these are just some recent moves that have been made yep. in that regard. So you mentioned Arizona, which yep. I, I think was the first state to pass an That's educational right. savings account law, which allows well, so you to, to make it universal. There's a lot of laws, yeah, but the difference right. in Arizona yes. is now everybody can do it. Yes, thank right. you for that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's uh, here we've got uh, Iowa just signed one, um, just Utah, it's been proposed, mean? Florida, it's been proposed. West Virginia legislature passed it. So this is definitely, there's there's a lot of momentum there. It's um, you say you're going to go there and investigate it. What kind of questions uh, do you have about educational well, savings? Accounts? It's just that, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, take my own advice on this. In other words, it's, it's, it's not as interesting to me, like public school, bad, private school, good, or charter mm -hmm. school, good. I, I want to know. I mean, look, the, the the libertarian gloss on this is once you give parents, you know, the backpack full of cash, they can they can Chinese menu, so to speak, or a la carte right. their way to a good education, you know, by by picking and choosing different providers and 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 programs and whatnot. I think that's interesting and and worthwhile, but I think that's going to be mostly at the high end. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm kind of interested. Uh, for both good and bad, what kind of entrepreneurial dynamism does this inject into a system? So I, I said this to somebody yesterday. If I were a much younger person, I'd move to Arizona right now and I'd start myself a low a low cost E.D. Hearst core knowledge private school. You know, mm -hmm. the, the 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 school of my dreams. You know, and and I'd I'd figure out a way to to, to price it at that seven thousand dollar you know per per right. family or per per kid price point to to make it work. Um, so it, uh, surely I can't be the only person who sees that opportunity. I, I just wrote a piece yesterday for the Dispatch about Great Hearts Academy, which is a terrific net network of charter schools. Um, they haven't announced this yet, but but they've they've confirmed that they are launching a, a a network of private Christian academies now, aimed at low income you know kids, starting in August. So in other words, uh, people who are in this work should should do what Great Hearts uh, they they predictably I would I would predict will do what Great Hearts is doing which is saying there's now this mechanism. What does this enable us to do that will serve families better? So I'm- Are, I'm, you, are you confident that the, uh, you know, that the supply is going to grow to uh, either increase demand or, or you know, satisfy it? Because wait, are, this was something- Are you a free market libertarian, Nick? Are, aren't yeah, no, no. Well, you know, I, I think a year ago or so, I talked with Chris Stewart, the, you know, who's an education uh, kind of, critic uh, and school choice advocate in Minnesota. And he was saying, you know what, when the pandemic hit, the big failure was that there was not the, there were not the schools ready. Like people in the school choice movement have been saying for a long time, you know, we, you know, we can handle it and they couldn't, but this gives them the money, right? So are well, you confident that, do you think well, if, that the if, market if, will if, be there? If it doesn't, then then there is a theoretical problem with that way of looking at schools, right? Yeah. I mean, in other words, this this should be if you're a Milton Friedman guy, this should be exactly right. what you want. 
you're now creating the conditions for the market to respond. So what's the market going to do? Yeah. What do you think, if anything, this will do for higher end education? Or if we can talk a little bit about this, because, yeah. you know, you know, when you look at a high end education, private schools or effectively, you know, high end private schools in towns or whatever that have, <laughs> you know, that have income levels and zoning yeah. and everything to keep it like that. Are they are they the incubators of the worst kind of curricula excesses, partly because they know that their kids can learn nothing from K through 12 or K through 24, you know, <laughs> years of school because they're going to be OK. Like they have the rich conversations at home. They have, you know, yeah. they have books everywhere, <laughs> et cetera. And is it is it partly that the rot in education, including this, you know, dismissal of core of cultural literacy, it's really coming from the top end. Uh, rather than something that like middle class people or or minority activists are are pushing. Yeah, this is another uh, a dicey subject. I mean, um, uh, my daughter went to one of these elite private schools, two of them, you know, end to end. And candidly, uh, and I have joked over the years that her attendance was the pr price of peace in my marriage because I was a mm -hmm. public school kid. And my wife was a private school girl. I'd get divorced today before I'd send my before I send my daughter to the two schools that she attended. Period. Um, and th this is the challenge for choice theory as well, right? In other words, if you think about, and I assume we're talking about these 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 super elite schools, which, by the way, yeah. probably won't ESAs won't make a difference. It's a right. rounding error on on the amount of money right. that these that these yeah. cause, and so they'll they'll take the money and apply it, but but you know, they, right. it's not going to change their behavior. Um, but this is a threat in my mind to choice theory, right? So if if you were suggesting. Okay, the, the, the kinds of parents who send their kids to these super elite Upper East Side, you know, Bethesda, whatever, Maryland, yeah. uh, private schools, these are folks who have the most options, the most choices, the most resources. And they are making a choice that, frankly, many of the parents dislike, okay? Super woke schools. And all yeah. they do is they sit there and seeve. And, and they don't, why don't they get up and change? Well, okay, you tell me why they don't get up and change. Uh, right? because, because the function because of the... Because what you alluded to. Yeah, right? I mean, the function words, of their, the... Their path is great. Yeah, and the function of the education system is not to challenge the existing class structure; it's to replicate it. I mean, I both public and private. I'm very Marxist uh, on that uh, on that front. So I, I, you know, I was at a dinner. I had dinner with David Mamet once. The uh, you know the playwright who bitched and moaned that his kids all went to Crossroads, which was you know started in Santa Monica as an alternative hip you know, very elite private school for Hollywood kids. Yeah. And he's like, oh, they learned nothing. They learned nothing. But it was like, well, why didn't you why? send your kids to a better school? And he's what like, what can you do? You know, it's like, send your you know, and it's like, school. yeah, no. And it's you like, because you, can hire you want the like signal that your kids are going to crossroads, et cetera. And yeah. all of this, it's like, there you go. That's can I ask? Thing. And, um, you know, we are, we have gone over time and I appreciate you saying with us because, uh, you know, we did have technical difficulties and stuff and whatnot, but, um, how do, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, the question about education, or maybe this is framing it wrong, but it is, how do you help, you know, and maybe it's the bottom 10% or the bottom 20% of kids who are coming from lower income or, or lower opportunity households. Like those are the people where school can be, education can be the real difference maker in their lives. Because okay. if you're middle class or upper middle class, it's like, School is kind of a tax that you pay, you know, like your your parents pay and you're, you're going to be pretty good anyway. But, you know, how do how do we make sure that those people really have the ability to, um, you know, kind of participate in, as fully in the American experiment? I mean, I think this is the best rhetoric of public schools. Like, how do we how do yeah. we make sure they're not, you know, just forgotten? Yeah, no, look, that, th thank you. That's a great question. And it's a great question to close on. And just very quickly, Nick, I, I don't want to be quite as blithe about high end and middle income kids. Your point is well taken. Mm -hmm. their, their, their outcomes are not guaranteed. It is the way to bet, however. Right. Um, but that, that bottom 10%, as you like, look, the, the, these are the kids that, that my career has been predicated upon helping them. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is why I think that choice will help them. But I'm not necessarily, I'm, I'm definitely not convinced it's a magic bullet. And I, and I think this is a real Achilles heel in choice theory. If the, if the idea is that if you set everybody free, they will make good decisions, many will, some will not. And this is also why I'm not abandoning the public school system, because that's as a practical matter where those kids are going to end up, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, 
I, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I have the answer, but I think this is a challenge for all of us who think of ourselves as choice advocates. Is you damn well better be thinking about those kids because it, it doesn't take a great deal of imagination to realize, let's say a year from now, you've got not just three states as ESA states, but 30, okay? Mm -hmm. And everybody is now suddenly in charge, um, you know, and, or you fast forward to the day when when parents are in control of, of 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 this spending, but then it turns out that we've created you know not, we have an underclass right now, but a profound underclass among people who are not just poorly educated but not educated at all. Well, there goes choice for generation or maybe more. So if we're not thinking about those kids, shame on us. Uh, Why, yeah, yeah, Zach? yeah. What I mean, I guess I it's. Uh, it's hard for me to see why that would be the outcome. I mean, wh what's like, going to prevent it, Zach? Wh wouldn't uh, there's what's going to prevent people from going to a school where their kids are just not learning anything? Well, or, 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 or just basically opting out of the system altogether. I'm taking my ESA money and, oh, there's oh, this I provider. Think. And yeah, sure. But then, you know, in other words, if you're cobbling together, you know, we, we, we assume that, that you know, uh, engaged, active, educated yeah. parents will make good choices. Well, are you going to deny the ability of, 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 of uh, lower income, low SES parents to make those same decisions? So you're saying uh, people just cobbling together a kind of homeschool type curriculum that yeah. just is n totally worthless. Yeah, that, okay. Yeah, exactly. Gotcha. I was misunderstanding. Yeah, my, well, I was just, no, you well, were misunderstanding. I was being insufficiently clear. Yeah. Do you, um, you know, one of the hallmarks I've, you know, for as long, I've been at Reason for 29 years and have always been interested in school choice and whatnot. And one of the things that I've always heard, and this actually, well, it's complicated. It describes my parents as well, who were not educated, but that low income parents, you know, they want educate in, in the main, they want better education for the kids. They want better opportunities. And they're pretty good at that. And that's, I mean, certainly in, uh, particularly in urban areas, um, you know, it seems like the early experiments with vouchers and things like that in places like Milwaukee and Dayton and, uh, uh, uh you know, a couple other places, you know, that seemed to be the case. I like, there's a lot of motivated low income parents, sure. um, you know, so maybe it will take care of itself. But I guess part of it is that we really have to wait and see what's going yeah. on. I think one thing that has to be, you know, anticipated uh, is that it, this is already a critique that is very common. And you see from, from people such as uh, John Oliver did a big uh, mm -hmm. thing uh, going after charter schools about six or seven years ago. Um, and the thrust of his argument was, look at this particular bad charter over here or this one over here and it just closed after you know less than a year and then these kids are left twisting uh in the wind right. and i mean the the theory of you know school choice people is like well that's kind of the process of choices you're weeding out the bad schools and to the degree that it's causing even you know district schools that shouldn't be open to close that's that's actually good but there is something to his argument that, you know, if you're the person who has your kid in that school when it closes down, that's extremely disruptive to your life. I mean, what is the, uh, is there any way to, like, what's the best way to cope with and, yeah. and deal with that argument? I, I don't think there's a perfect answer here. And yeah. this is why there's kind of got to be almost, I mean, to use a legal analogy, like almost joint and several accountability. But my, my Arizona friends love to point to Arizona charters as having solved this uh, because in most states, I think it takes five years to get your charter renewed. And in Arizona, I believe it's 15. And he, you know, Matt Ladner um, and mm -hmm. others have pointed out that um, by the time year 15 rolls around, parents have long since voted with their feet. OK, right. and, and that's that's probably right, but it's not a guarantee. Uh, because again, we're, we're talking about kind of boutique, very small numbers of, of schools and students. Mm -hmm. Would that work nationally? I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I think uh, it, 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 there, look, there's, there's no substitute for increased parental sophistication, you know, mm -hmm. and, and if there's been a theme to this conversation, it's none of these mechanisms work um, by themselves. There's no perpetual motion machine here. You've got to create the conditions that, that you know, in, in, uh, that, that create parental, not just choice, but sophistication about these things. I mean, the analogy I always use is if you go to your pediatrician and, and they send you home with a prescription, by the time you get home, you've already looked on WebMD, you know, about, you know, right. so you know all the side effects of, of what your pediatrician's offering you. We don't do that with education. You know, in fact, I would, I would bet my last dollar 
that if you poll even sophisticated parents about, hey, what's the ELA curriculum at your kid's school? Eight yeah. out of 10 wouldn't even know. And, it, and it or makes, how to evaluate it. So yeah, it let me, uh, let's end on this note, uh, which maybe dis you can dismiss it as well. But, you know, one of the things that the National Assessment of Educational Progress does, you know, going back to the early 70s, it tracks kind of student scores. Uh, they've been pretty flat. And depending on how you calculate it, we're spending two to three times as much per pupil in real inflation adjusted terms. Is it just that kids are dumber now? that we have to spend more and more money on them to keep them at the same or slightly lower level than when you and I, Robert, were you know, in short pants. Zach was not quite born yet. And his SATs, I guarantee you, are better than mine, probably yours, you know, but. Uh, no, but not, I mean, is, a that, brag. is it, is it a, <laughs> yeah, no, that's for sure. Is it, I mean, you know, it, it's, a, it's a weird thing. Like, are we, are we obsessing over education in a way? And I'm joking about kids just being dumber, but, you know, because education, you know, going back to Socrates, you know, educating the young is absolutely filled with existential anxiety of every society. And, sure. you know, so is all anxiety. of this just kind of like, you know, we're, we're just, we got a lot of nervous energy and a lot of money to spend and a lot of time to argue. But, you know, actually, the kids are doing okay. Uh, I, I don't think the kids are doing okay. And I don't want to be alarmist about this. Mm -hmm. we, something we haven't even touched on is mental health. You know, and if you right. talk to John Haidt and Greg Lukianoff mm -hmm. and others, they'll say it's it's the screen yeah. is stupid. And I think there's a compelling case for, for the deleterious effects of social media and technology and whatnot. You know, it's, so it, it's almost impossible to separate schools from all the other effects in kids' lives. Mm -hmm. um, do, do I think kids have gotten dumber no, kids have not gotten dumber kids have gotten smarter um do i think we have gotten accidentally less good at educating them probably uh, and it, and it probably has to do with some of the factors we talked about earlier nick about how there wasn't there didn't used to be a lot of question about what you did in school all day and the more sophisticated we've gotten yeah. in terms of trying to raise levels of you know problem solving and critical thinking we've actually got, made it worse not better you've got the issue of of who becomes a teacher um, you know, uh, nobody should want women to, 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 to leave law and medicine and whatnot mm -hmm. and go back into the classroom. But, but if you think about, I'll, I'll bet like you, like me, Nick, some of your teachers in retrospect were women who today would have been doing much more remunerative things than they did 40 or 50 mm -hmm. years ago. It, it's a Gordian knot, you know, I, I, I don't thinking know also, you, you know, the amount of environmental lead was so much higher, you know, and lead gets a bad rap, but I don't know when, you know, when we were chewing on lead paint and breathing in lead gasoline air fumes. I don't know, yeah. we seem to be doing better as a uh, as a society. Yeah, look, the, the, the one, uh, this be my parting shot, I guess, but yeah. the, the, the one, if I, if, I, if I could make one change in American education now, it would probably be, and this gets to the idea of, is it getting, is, is, is it getting worse? I, I think what's changed is our expectations have gotten um, uh, outsized for American mm -hmm. education. And, and most specifically, what I mean by that is we literally expect too much, uh, not of education, but of teachers. We keep asking them to do more and more. And at the same, and I, I, look, I mean, this is the, the, the last hill I'll die on in education. I, I point this out all the time. You've got 4 million American men and women um, in classrooms every day. If you have 4 million of anybody doing anything, by definition, you're going to have a, a normal range of human capacity in, in a number that large. No. So you've got to make that job doable by those people. The cavalry isn't coming. There are not enough saints and superstars to, 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 to fill all those classrooms. We've got to reconceive the job of, of, of teacher to be doable by men and women of ordinary sentience because that's who we have and that's all we're ever going to have. So if the job can't be done well by those people, it, you, you, you don't have a plan. You, you're, 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 it's a prayer. Yeah. All right. That's a uh, sober but uh, resounding note to end on. Robert Pondicio, you're at American Enterprise Institute. Where's the best place that people can follow your reading? We'll have something in the uh, show notes and stuff. But uh, uh, Yeah, at, at AEI or just on Twitter. Pretty much everything I write yeah. ends up on, on, on my Twitter R, account. R. R. Pondicio. R. Right? Pondicio, yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not hard well, to find. Thank you, Zach Weismiller, as always. Thank thanks for uh, staging a great conversation. Mm -hmm. thanks, Enjoy thanks. it, gentlemen. Thanks for having you me. You bet.